Well, good evening. And uh, it's good to see so many of you here tonight for this service. Um, I don't think I've got... Well, I had a lot of notices this morning. One that I neglected to say was that just for the next two or three weeks, to get to the toilets, you have to go through the new hall. They are still, still open, but um, there's work going on there um, in preparation for moving the disabled toilet and then um, enlarging the kitchen. Um, I'm going to just read some verses, and I didn't know when I prepared this what some of the songs were going to be. But, um, and they come from Philippians, Philippians 9 to 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And I was just sort of thinking about how what the name Jesus conjures up. It, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful name, particularly when you associate it with Jesus, the person. Uh, it stands for love and patience, kindness, forbearance, and for sacri self-sacrifice. And it's a sweet name because you can think of the tears that were shed, the pain, the agony, but also the glory that came through. A powerful name a mighty and powerful name, a name that can bring people to their knees, can drive, can uh, uh, slay the, de the devil, and so on. And a name, as we've already read, at which every knee is going to bow, bow at some point. An enduring name, it just goes on forever. I mean, our, our names will fade from memories, but the name of Jesus lives on forever and ever, and it's a glorious name when we consider what he did for us and when we consider what we're going to be celebrating later on at the communion, then surely we, we must say that his name is glorious. And we sing many songs about the name of Jesus. And uh, one of them has this chorus, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Let's just come and commit this service to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we just come before you, and as we gather here tonight, we ask and we pray that you will make your presence felt here tonight. Lord, we know that you're with us wherever we go, whatever we're doing, but Lord, as we gather here tonight, we want to feel you moving amongst this place tonight. As we lift our hearts to you in, in praise and worship, Lord, we just ask and pray that that will bring a smile to your face that we give you pleasure to hear us open our hearts up to you in praise and worship. And Lord, we are aware that many of our, our fellowship perhaps are going through difficult times. Lord, and we just, in these few moments, just bring them to you by name. May you be with them, Lord, whatever their need is tonight. May you be providing that need. Lord, if it's, a, if it's your comfort they need, whether it's your peace, your healing touch upon them, Lord, we just ask and pray that that's what you will be giving them right now. But Lord, we want them to know that you're there, that you love them, and that you care for them. And Lord, we just come now. We pray for Rab as he opens your word for us tonight. Lord, we know that he has spent time with you, Lord, in preparation for this, Lord. So we just ask and pray that as he, as, as he, as he opens your word tonight, that we will be aware that it is you speaking through him and that we will take note of what you're saying, that we will respond to what you're saying. So, Lord, we just come now and as we... Lift our hearts to you, Lord. We just pray that you will just receive our worship. Amen. Thank you, Peter. You know, the Lord does work in mysterious ways and wonderful ways. Our first song this evening says in the first chorus, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. It goes on to say, what a wonderful name it is, Death could not hold him. 
The veil tore before him. He silenced the boast of sin and grave. But the second verse says these lovely words. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, but your love was greater. What can separate us now? He truly is our Lord and our Savior. He truly has a beautiful, a wonderful, an all-compassing name. And let's sing our worship to him tonight. Just let's stand as we sing.
You know, I said to the guys tonight that are in the band, not just the guys, the guys and the gals, um, but uh, I said, we're going to do an old song, an oldie. So we've got the oldie to sing. So we've got the oldie to sing. <laughs> we've drafted in a very own oldie, who's older than me, just, just, <coughs> Kenny, just older than me. I'm not as and old as this song, by the way. <laughs> no, that's true. Although you are very like the person who wrote oh, it. Bill that. Gaither, that is, of course. <laughs> um, we're going to sing, and uh, God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, heal, and forgive. Anna's going to sit this one out and just enjoy Kenny singing it, she said. So we're going to enjoy it. But just sing, sing your heart out as we sing this golden oldie, but it's such a great song. God sent his son. <laughs> God sent his son. hand for Kenny. <laughs> Fantastic. Now we'll go to one slightly newer and we'll hand it back to the young ones uh, to lead us through and as great are you Lord. All the earth will shout your praise 
our hearts will cry and these bones will sing great are you Lord Good evening. It's great to be together this evening again, and uh, just as I've said time and time again, but I'll keep saying it, it's just lovely to be able to uh, begin our Sabbath just opening in worship and prayer, and 
uh, praising him and close it in the same way. It's just such an encouragement to us. Tonight, we're kind of finishing what has been an unwillingness to let go of Jonah over these last couple of weeks when we finished Jonah and that very last verse of, you know, should, should I not care for that great city in and of 120,000 people don't know the left hand from the right and just that sense um, that's really been lingering amongst leadership, I think, as well, like discussing, of Murray being 100,000, shouldn't we care for, for these great council area, whatever you want to call it, who don't know the left hand from the right. And uh, as I was kind of preparing, I've been looking through uh, sections of prayer, obviously for our morning series, and came across in Colossians 4. If you've got blue Bibles, it's 985, page 985. And while I was reading it for the, the point of prayer, uh, I was looking for something with Paul or maybe with Jesus. I wasn't quite sure. We obviously looked at the rich young man uh, two weeks ago together. And this just stood out to me as, as an incredibly practical uh, section that Paul writes in Colossians. It's, it's very encouraging um, for us. And so, you know, Paul is probably the most famous uh, evangelist. Jesus is the best evangelist. We said last week that Jesus was, uh, sorry, two weeks ago, uh, we said that Jesus was the greatest evangelist, just as he was really the greatest at everything. He was a Sunday school picnic's nightmare, I suppose, in that sense. At least he uh, emptied himself enough that he might have run a race. But when it came to evangelism and teaching, he was the greatest teacher. But it would be fair to say that Paul was the most famous for his evangelism. Planting churches all through Asia Minor, even into Europe. He was the one that uh, went to, to Europe, maybe the first one to go to Europe. And it was Paul who wrote so many of the letters in the New Testament, including the one in Colossians that we're looking at this evening. Paul, we know, is in prison during this time. If you read the whole of chapter 4, uh, we'll see, we're not going to read it all tonight, but the section we're looking at tonight has verse 3 in it, speaks about being in prison. Uh, you'll see a fellow prisoner, Articus, in verse 10, and Paul asks in verse 18 for those reading the letter to remember his chains. So most believe this is when Paul's two-year imprisonment in Rome, and we're told at the very end of Acts, he, that's Paul, lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. And then we don't really know exactly what happened to him after those two years, but likely he got released, and shortly after that was rearrested and killed, eh, possibly under Nero. Paul hasn't met the people in the Colossian church, but he knows the church only because of the fellow workers, a man called Epaphras, who's from Colossae, he went back there to start a church there, and he's come to visit Paul and update him on what was going on in the church. And so Paul starts out giving thanks for the gospel being fruitful in that city, and then he quickly starts to address some of the false teaching that had come into the church. He goes straight to the, the, the deity, yeah, that Jesus is fully God and fully human, and then he goes on to teach the, the supremacy, the, the, the exclusivity of Jesus, that is that he's the only one who can save us. And so we can kind of work backwards from that, that there were people who were corrupting the message, beginning to question who Jesus was, and also trying to add to the gospel. You know, you need Jesus and to follow these rules. You need Jesus and to do this, that, and the other thing in order to get salvation, instead of denying the fact that it's a free gift given to us purely by what Jesus has done, as we'll come to remind ourselves tonight when we come to the table. And then in chapters three and four, we explain what this life in Christ looks like. And in chapter four, we have this lovely section uh, that we have. So let's read together from Colossians chapter 4, beginning at verse 2, going down to verse 6. Colossians uh, chapter 4, if I said 2, beginning at verse 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word, to declare the mystery of Christ, on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Amen. God's word to us this evening, and let's just turn to him in prayer now, before we turn back to this passage. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. 
We thank you for this section in Colossians. We thank you for the example of the life of Paul, a life that in the world's eyes was such a wasted life, such an opportunity to be a great, respected, rich teacher. And yet he became a man who was driven from villages and cities, in prison, beaten. And yet, Lord, we know that this man chose well. We know that he understood exactly what it meant to have life in all of its abundance. He knew what it was to store up treasures in heaven where it cannot be stolen from thieves or destroyed by moths. He knew what it was to live a life faithful to you. And so, Lord Jesus, we ask as we come to this word that you would reveal through your spirit to our hearts and our eyes and our ears and our minds to know deeper what it is to follow you, to know deeper what it is to share your wonderful message that, Lord, you might be glorified here in Lossiemouth and in its surrounding areas. We ask these things in your precious and your holy and your gracious name. Amen. So Paul starts out in verse 2 by asking the church to continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. What does it mean to continue steadfastly in prayer? And why, in this section at least, does Paul start here? Just spent in the morning some 10 to 11 weeks on a Sunday morning working through the Lord's prayer together. And we did it because prayer is at the heart of the church. We certainly cannot become effective at communicating the gospel to others without first communicating with God. It's a recognition that we're not doing these things on our strength, but on God's strength. And continue steadfastly is Paul's way of, of telling us to do it in a continuous way of life. There's a little booklet that's quite well known. I think it went out of fashion um, for a while because of some of the misunderstanding of its teaching, but it's called Practicing the Presence of God by a guy called Brother, Brother Lawrence. And he was a failed priest. He, didn't, he wasn't clever enough, or whatever the reason was, he couldn't become a, a priest. This is before the Reformation, so it's okay to be a priest. And uh, along came all these ministers. All these other priests would come and see him and speak to him because his insights were so deep. And people always left saying he smelt of the fragrance of Christ. And what did he do? Well, he did dishes. And when he couldn't stand anymore because he had some shrapnel in his hip, he ended up repairing shoes. And the whole letters, that the book is designed of his letters that he'd written to some of the other ministers and, and other Christians and believers and things that he'd written to, someone gathered up all the letters they could find and put it into this book. And he speaks about doing everything to the Lord. And he speaks about washing the dishes to the Lord and recognizing his presence and praying continuously as he's in his presence. An amazing a ability of this unlearned man to teach you so much about practicing continually the presence of God and doing everything in a worship to God and in prayer to God. It's an amazing little book. It's not the easiest to understand fully, but you'll get the gist of it if you read it anyway. But it's this thing of Paul saying, don't just pray when it's convenient. Don't just pray when you need something. Don't just pray when you're with others, but make prayer something continuous and anchored in your life. Paul goes on to ask that the church would then be watchful in prayer with thanksgiving. Interesting point to make. It's full, this passage of, of amazing thoughts. When we pray, we're going to become watchful for God's response. And in a natural way, certainly prayer makes us more aware of the presence of God. That's why we're encouraged to pray every morning because we set our day up knowing that God go with us as we go into this day and we're more aware of his presence, but he's telling us when we pray to be watchful for answered prayer. Now, just take a minute and think about this. When you pray, what do you do normally? If you pray with someone, you normally move on, don't you? Maybe next time you see them, you say, oh, um, how did that work out that we prayed together with? But there's a, a sense that we don't actually watch our prayers. We're not actually watchful of what we're praying, saying, Lord, I know you're the God who responds to prayer, so when I pray, I'm going to look out and watch and wait for you to answer. I'm going to be alert and tuned into you and switched on, ready to see what answer you're going to give. So Paul adds that we're to be watchful in it with thanksgiving. Are we good at being thankful to God? Are we good at thanking him for answered prayer? For every day, the good gifts of good health and clothing. 
so easy to pray and forget. I remember an experience of this, and I think the experience of it was because it was people looking at becoming Christians, but it was an Alpha course. We crept a prayer diary, which was everyone's prayer hits, you know, prayer lists that we took of this group of people. And every single one of the prayers was answered. And this is something when you speak to people about these type of courses, it's often the case. I think really we don't get answered prayer when we're older in our faith because we need to learn that God says no. But in those early days, I think he's incredibly gracious to respond to us in order that we might see the nature and character of God. But what amazed me was, really for me it was like, I was more amazed than they were, (laughs) maybe shamefully. But as we went through these 10 weeks, everything was getting ticked and ticked and ticked as they were praying. And I thought to myself, I never do this with my prayers. I never actually go back and check what happened to my prayers. I just pray, and then I've done the prayer, it's over to you. I'm not watchful, and I'm certainly, because I'm not watchful, I'm not thankful about my prayers. And yet, with this other context where you're meant to be the facilitator, I'm sitting here thinking, that's a great idea. (laughs) I'm going to start taking a list of my prayers, and then I'm going to be watchful and then I'm going to be thankful with it. In the same way, it's so easy for us to pray and never think about our prayers again. And because of that, we're not looking out for the fact that God is responding to our prayers. And because we're not looking out for him responding, we're forgetting to go back and give thanks. Now, I know God's gracious, and I know he's kind, and I know he's merciful, but isn't it a little bit sad if all we ever do is give, us our, give him our list and we forget to go back and say thank you? You know, it's, it's just a little bit ungrateful, isn't it? If a, a kid keeps coming for a lollipop but doesn't say thank you ever, at some point you're going to say, look, you can have the lollipop, but go and say the magic words, please. And in the same way, God's not going to refuse us, maybe, but wouldn't it be better if we came to him with that kind of attitude of thankfulness and of gratitude and of watching? Lord, I know I've given you this prayer. Now I want to see what you're going to do with it. Now I want to see your will unfold in this situation. And then I want to give you thanks for the way that you let it unfold. That's just the first verse that Paul's giving us. To be steadfast in prayer, watchful, and giving thanks. Amazing, amazing. Then Paul goes on in verse 3 to say at the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. This bit really encourages me. It might encourage you. Paul is writing to encourage, but also to correct this church. If ever there was a hierarchy relationship, this letter was an example of it. This church had allowed false teaching to come in at some place. And clearly, it's in such a way that Epaphras has gone to Paul and said, I mean, I essentially need it that he's tearing his hair out a little bit and saying, oh, this teaching is just sticking like glue into this church. And, you know, I've got these people sorted, but certain people are just gripped by these teachers. And it's a total headache. And we're trying as a leadership to deal with it. And it's really difficult to deal with. And Paul comes in and he's coming in with this authority as an apostle. He's coming in with an authority as as one amongst the 12. You know, the 12 were the ones who followed Jesus. They had, well, the 11 and then added in Matthias, but they had this authority. And yet Paul is like accepted as one of them. He's also called an apostle and he's also recognized as as the one who goes to the Gentiles. Like that's his position. Like Peter to the Jews, Paul to the Gentiles. It wasn't exclusive, but it shows you the kind of authority that Paul had. When he comes into this, rather than saying, listen, I'm Paul, get it sorted out, and I've got everything sorted, so be like me. Instead, he comes and he asks for prayer. Pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mysteries of Christ. It's amazing that Paul is asking here, for prayer. And I take encouragement from that because I certainly need prayer for this. But Paul even needs prayer. He says, look, I'm in prison. I've got these soldiers who come in to watch me while I'm under house arrest. Visitors who probably come to speak to me who are curious about this faith. Jews who want to interact with me because he has vast knowledge and education of the Jewish law. Whatever the reason, Paul took as many opportunities as he could while he was in Rome 
And he continues to pray and asks for prayer for more opportunity. There's a hunger for Paul, which is to be admired and, and desired in our own lives. But he also recognized that we need to put prayer for these situations in. And he was willing to turn to this church and say, I need your prayer. I need your help. Please, can you pray for me? That doors would be opened for the word to be given. As 1 Corinthians 3 tells us, one may plant the seeds of faith, another water it, but it's God who's the one who gives the growth. And so him asking Colossian church for prayer is a recognition that he's never going to have these opportunities. He's never going to have this effectiveness unless they first seek God so they would be on his strength and not on their own strength to share these mysteries of Christ. Then he goes on in verse 4 to make a deeper request about what he shares with those who come his way. And at the end, I'm going to kind of retell you these things because I do think it's amazing the way that Paul works these things all together. It's like a foundation on a foundation on a foundation and so on. But verse 4, he says, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. Clarity is every preacher's prayer. How easy it is to make uncomplicated things complicated. How easy it is to get sidetracked by our own interests. How easy it is to, to talk about everything which you're taking a, a, a kind of defined interest in that no one else cares about instead of speaking about the thing that you're here to speak about and keeping it simple. Paul says, give me clarity. Recently, I was meeting with some other ministers and we were just talking about our current situation after the lockdown. We were sharing amongst ourselves how things had been and how we were doing in our leadership and how the churches were and things. And they were sharing a conviction that they had. That they've come out of this time with a real sense of the simplicity of the gospel. Not always easy to live out, but it's fair to say that the gospel itself is fairly simple to understand. And they said, you know, I think we've made church too complicated and we just need to get back to basics. And I could sympathize with what they were saying. And as I was looking at Paul, I was thinking about that sense of Paul saying, let's just keep things clear. Let's just keep it what it's meant to be. Not always that easy to live out the gospel, but it's easy enough to understand it for ourselves. We don't have to learn another language. We don't have to do a degree. We can simply understand that we're sharing a very, very simple fact of who Jesus is. Maybe it's our human nature that like to complicate things, but Paul says, help me have clarity so that we don't get distracted and we keep things simple and clear. And elsewhere, Paul says that it's where the power comes from. As a leadership, we were looking at 1 Corinthians 1 in verse 17 says, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom. This is the funny bit. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power not with words of eloquent wisdom, unless the cross be emptied of its power. And we began to discuss, in the short time, it was a very short discussion to be fair, but, but what I found quite confusing, Paul avoided eloquent wisdom so that nobody thought the growth of the church was down to his great ability to speak or his power. He kept things simple, not only so they'd be easy to understand, but also so that the cross of Christ would not be emptied of its power. That's why prayer remains so vital. We've asked God to do it because it's God is the only one who can do it by the power of the cross of Christ. And we can see from verse four that this is how we are meant to speak. Notice how Paul puts it, that I may make it clear for that is a, for which I ought, for that's how I ought to speak. The word ought, whether we become unclear because we lack confidence to share or more likely because we get bogged down in details. Paul says that we ought to keep things clear. We ought to keep it simple and pray that God would work in the life of those who hear us. And then Paul goes on in verse five to say, walk in the wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Again, this is such an interesting verse along with verse six. You need wisdom when you walk to outsiders. You need to make the best use of your time. It's safe to say that most unbelievers have no real concept of what they are missing out on. It'd be wonderful if everyone could know what it is to be in relationship to God because everyone would realize how empty life is without him 
and they would come running into the church. But the fact is, the gospel is not always well received. Some people look glazed, some people just shut off, some people just think you're strange. I'm sure you can think of some other reactions. Paul says, be wise with those people and use your time carefully. Makes me think of another verse which uh, equally catches me out a little bit in Matthew 7. Don't give dogs what's holy and do not throw pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. What does Jesus mean by this? Who gives pearls to pigs? What a waste of pearls to give them to pigs. What a waste of a holy thing to give them to dogs. I might be first reading this saying, you know, don't waste time on certain people who are like dogs or pigs. But I think it's more likely saying dogs have no appreciation of holy things and pigs have no use of pearls. As a pig cannot digest a pearl, it'll never thank you for them, so it's more likely to end up biting you. Because at least you can be eaten. At least you're profitable in their mouth more than pearls are. Jesus saying, be wise with who you give others, with what you give to others. And don't think that everyone's just going to thank you for the good news of Jesus Christ. Walk wisely. You only have so much time in a day, so use your time effectively. A man was telling me how he's not allowed to talk about Jesus in his mother's house. He has an amazing testimony. Everybody wants to listen to this guy. I think I've mentioned him probably in the past, in passing. He used to be one of the hardest prisoners in Britain. He was in the high security, and then he was in the high security ward of the high security prison, lots of high security. And when he came to faith, he now goes around churches, and he goes around prisons, and he tells everyone uh, about how he came to faith and how he's given up. And once his prison guards were his enemies, but now they're his friends, and that's what the Bible says, like, you know, you, you, you meet your friends, your enemies, and he's got this great testimony about it all that he gives but he's not allowed to mention Jesus in his mother's house. The moment he mentions Jesus, she says, get out. Get out the house. And there's a sense where other people are longing to hear from him about Jesus. And he says, there's no point spending this time with my mother telling her about Jesus because I'll end up with no relationship with my mother. But there are all these other people who want to hear my story of what's happened. And so I'm going to spend my time effectively. I'm going to walk in wisdom and go and speak to those people about it. And so he was telling me how he's trying to find other reasons, more relaxed reasons to start those early conversations with his mother. You know, he might go at Christmas and try and watch a Christmas film with a bit of the gospel in it. You know, Prince of Egypt or something, that's not a Christmas film, but whatever it would be. But going in and trying subtle ways to get the gospel into the house, because he knows the moment he mentions Jesus, he'll get the door to go into but other people are dying to hear from him. And it just makes you realize, you know, not everyone is going to well receive what we're saying. So don't throw pearls at pigs and then get annoyed at people when they don't receive the gospel. They're not ready for the gospel. We have to go back to that place of prayer and say, Lord, give us opportunities. Give us a sense of when's right. Give us the way to do this. Let us walk in wisdom. That we don't put people's guards up. We don't make things worse, but actually give us the wisdom to know how to come alongside others. And in a helpful way, to come and use our time effectively that they might be open to what we're beginning to say to them. A great piece of advice. It doesn't mean you're, you're off the hook. You know, that's what everyone worries about. It means walk in wisdom. Use your time effectively. Be alert of God's presence. Pray for these situations and see when they come, but recognize times when we're going to do more harm than good by trying to ram the gospel into every place that we can with people who just know we're going to ram the gospel. So they don't really want you around for dinner because they don't want to be rammed that day. It's a sense of wisdom that we need to have with us. And finally, Paul finishes a section calling us in verse six to let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Sometimes we care more about the information we share than the way we share it. We feel like we have to cover all our points, you know, get from creation to rebellion to redemption to heaven, but we don't particularly stop to consider how we're sharing it. We're cutting the people off sometimes of what they're saying 
in order to get our points across. Look, I've got five points, I need to get a point. I need to do this drawing, and there's sin in the middle, and us on this side, and God on this side. If you could just stop talking for a minute, I'll get to show you this drawing. And we get so into the information, and we're just kind of waiting. And you get that, it's terrible. I do it myself, so I'm confessing here. But you've got that look on your face where you're just waiting to say your next point, and the person knows they're not listening to what I'm actually saying. They're just waiting to make their next point for it. Turns out it's just as important how you say something as it is what you say. A message of love shared by a man shouting may not quite have the grace that's intended. Jesus was able to be tender without ever being weak. When the crowd brought a woman to Jesus who'd been caught in adultery, he started to write something in the sand and they all walked away one by one till no one was left. And John 8, he looked up and he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go. And from now on, sin no more. In this moment, when he had to, expected, I suppose, to fulfill the law, to get involved, to be just as angry. In fact, he says he was without sin, cast the first stone. And he would have had every right, wouldn't he, of picking up the first rock and beginning the stoning. But he doesn't do it. He's tender and gracious. But he's not so tender and gracious that he just says everything's fine. He turns to her with that incredible grace and that incredible love and is able to say to her without any sense of weakness, without any sense of unfairness, go and sin no more. Jesus gives the message that all of us needed to receive when Jesus tenderly and lovingly turns to us and says to each one of us, through me you're not condemned, but go and sin no more. We need to have that sense of Christ. We can't forgive sins, absolutely, but we can show that tenderness and grace to others. And Paul is saying, speak with grace and leave a lingering taste of Christ like salt leaves a lingering taste. And then, Paul's saying, people might start to ask you questions that you can answer them. Look at the way it turns in verse six. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. What are you answering? You're answering the question. Why are there questions? There are questions because of the grace and the seasoned salt that's coming across in your life. So that maybe before there were people who forcing the gospel onto them and finding any opportunity to, to throw, you know, five points of Calvinism at them seemed like throwing pearls at pigs and was only making them more stubborn against it. Suddenly with your life and your words, they're turning and saying, why do you do this? Why are you like this? What is it about you? And then you'll be ready. And then you'll be able as you ought. <laughs> you may know how you ought to answer each person. I love these oughts that Paul has. There's a no-brainer. We ought to answer them. But let's wait till we're asked in those circumstances and those people. I think this is incredible. I love the way it builds up. He starts out by saying to pray continuously, being watchful for answers and thankful. Then he goes on to pray for opportunities. And as we pray for opportunities, we want to be watchful for God answering our prayers. And we want to be thankful when we get those opportunities. So in this week ahead, let's start our morning by saying, Lord, give me opportunities. Then we're seeking clarity when we speak, knowing that it comes from the power of prayer because it's God who is the power of the cross of Christ, not us. We can plant, we can water, but it's God who gives the seeds of faith. Then we seek God for the wisdom as we speak to others, making the most, uh, the best use of our time, sharing with those who are given to share with. And we share it in the right way by sharing it with grace. 
so that we not only speak words of good news, but we receive the words in the good news of Jesus, who is tender and loving, but direct. He's not weak in that way. He's not uh, pretending everything's okay when there's not. He's not compromising the message. He's gracious and loving, but direct. So that through that, people might begin to ask us questions about it. Isn't that incredible, the way Paul has written that? Isn't it incredible, the way it just layers and layers and layers? It begins with prayer. It begins with opportunities. It seeks out clarity seeks out wisdom and wants to be shared in the right way in order that people might ask us questions. That is, I think I put the title as Paul's master class of evangelism. And I think that's a pretty master class, to be honest. Something incredible that Paul understands exactly what we're looking at. And yet when you break it down, it's not so crazy. It doesn't really feel like the way often our everyday feels like when we're just finding ways, like, Lord, help me to force it into my colleague. And I, I remember doing that myself in other jobs that I was in. It was like, Lord, find me ways. And rather than listen to him, I wasn't watchful and I wasn't thankful. I was more like, you know, when you try and fit things in the bin, it was more like that with the gospel into people. Not that I was actually kicking them, obviously, but uh, just that way of crushing it into every situation. So that if they asked you where, you know, the DVDs were, you were like, well, have you seen the DVD about Jesus? You know, that kind of idea of just forcing it in so that no one wants to speak to you. Don't be like that. Take these simple, simple, practical aspects. Start with God. Seek out God. Look for what God's doing. Look for clarity. Look for that wisdom. And do it graciously that people might ask us questions. That's Paul's master class. And it's a great lesson for us to take hold of in our everyday life. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that when we come to Paul, we see someone who lived up to the words that he shared. Even in prison, as he was there, he would have been justified to kept quiet for two years in order that he might be able to be released and continue your work. But Lord, even in prison, he was unwilling to deviate from what you'd called him to do. And Lord, in the simplicity of the gospel, we recognize that you have called us to make disciples not just the apostles, not just pastors, not just leaders. Every single one of us are to go and make disciples. And Lord, we know that can be hard in different aspects of our lives, but we also know that that's what you've called us to do and that when you call us to do things, you will equip us to do them. So Lord, would you give to our minds each morning the reminder to come before you and pray for opportunities and that be watchful and thankful when you give them to us, Lord. May we walk in wisdom and have clarity in what we say. May we be gracious as we say it. And may, Lord, people who before look like pearls to pigs or holy things to dogs, as they just reject anything we say, may just the loving words, the loving actions be enough by your Spirit to begin to change the way they see others, the way they see something different in us, that they might ask these questions. And Lord, we ask it not because... We want to be successful. We ask it because we know what it is to experience the life that you give to us. And Lord, we don't want to be selfish and hoard it. We don't want to hold on to it for ourselves, but we want to see others experience this life-saving power that without which we can never be saved, but with, we can know eternally you. We can be secure. We can be at peace. And so, Lord, for your kingdom and for your glory, we pray it for our community, in our workplaces, in the places we go this week. In your name we pray. Amen. I love you, Lord, though your mercy never fails me all my days. I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head. I will sing of the goodness of of God. I love your voice. You've led me through the fire. In the darkest night, you're close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. Tonight, we have the privilege of singing, all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you've been so, so good. 
With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's stand as we sing, I love you, Lord. sins away, slain for us, and we remember the promise made that all who come in faith find forgiveness at the cross. We look at the bread and we look at the wine set before us this evening. As we share in this bread of life, we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of peace around the table of the King. The body of our Savior, Jesus Christ, torn for you eat and remember the wounds that heal, the death that brings us life tonight. Paid the price to make us one. As we share in this bread of life and we drink of the sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of love around the table of the King. Yet we go on and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of grace. And we've been reminded of that tonight around the table of the King. Yet as we share in his suffering, we proclaim Christ will come again. 
and we'll join in the feast of heaven around the table of the king. These emblems are just simple. Nothing important about them. And as we've said before, this one day will not matter. We will need it no longer. Yet till that day, let's sing about the love, about the peace, and about the bonds that bring us to the table of our King tonight, just before we break bread together.
Colossians, the letter that we've been looking at, says at the beginning, well, at the first chapter, at verse 19, for in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death, in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Jesus Christ, in him is all the fullness of God, fully God, fully human. We're told he was pleased to dwell. For our sake, he came in order to reconcile to himself all things. And so that we who are once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, have now been reconciled by his body. By his body, represented by this bread. By his blood, represented here by this juice. He held back nothing. But in order that we would no longer be alienated from God, but reconciled as all things were reconciled to him. And we often talk about recon he's reconciled us to God, the Father, which is true. But here, Paul emphasizes the fact that all things were reconciled to him. And all things came into the world through him. And all things are reconciled to him through him so that we, through faith, can come and know that reconciliation, that forgiveness of sins, that alienation no more, so that we can call home the place of heaven, so that we can call our Father our heavenly Father, rather than the one who judges us, instead the one that we're brought near to through the work of Jesus. This is the great thing that Jesus has done for us. And because we so easily forget because we so easily push it out of our mind or maybe even so easily complicate things. Jesus set up this table so that all those who know and love the Lord can come to this table and be reminded that you come with nothing to offer but everything to receive. And that here, as Paul wanted to say to the Colossians, the work of Christ is sufficient meaning nothing else can be brought, nothing else can be added, nothing else is needed. But this bread and this wine represents that Jesus has done it all, that we might be made children of God. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come and feast and be reminded of who you are in Christ. We'll have the prayer for the bread and the wine. Lord, as we look at these elements here, we're reminded of how deep your love is for us. How deep the Father's love that he should send his Son, Lord. And we, <clears throat> we come and we come in that attitude of not knowing what we can do except accept your son has paid it all. And Lord, we just thank you. We, we think of the, 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 the tears and the, the anguish and the, and the hurt and the pain and the agony of the cross. And you bore that for us. And we just thank you, Lord. We just thank you as we, as we eat the bread and remember your body hanging upon that cross. As we drink from the cup and remember that blood poured out for us, that cleansing flow. And we're just so thankful, Lord, we're just so thankful that you loved us so much that you were prepared to do this for us, to send your son to die for us in order to pay a price that we cannot pay. 
And so, Lord, with thankful hearts, we, we eat the bread and we drink from the cup. And we say, hallelujah, what a saviour. Amen. Paul, writing to the church in Crown, says, I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We'll take the bread as we receive it. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We'll hold on to our cups as we receive them as a sign of our unity in Christ.
as often as you eat this bread or drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's close our service together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to proclaim the power of your death. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to remind us that all things have been reconciled to you, of the pleasure that you've brought to your Father in heaven from your obedience and your love that you, in the fullness of God, have dwelt pleasedly, taken on flesh for our sake, willingly, accepting the mission that we might be made once again children of God, taken from that departedness in the Garden of Eden between uh, Adam and Eve and brought back in not just to your family, but through Christ even closer. Lord, for those at the moment who are struggling, who feel weak or are weak, who feel you're far from them, Lord, may they, whether they're here or not, we pray that this reminder at this table, that the empty cross and the empty grave would be a reminder to them that your work is complete. That, Lord, we can rest on that great foundation. Lord, for each one of us as we leave tonight, would you give us a sense of going with us, a sense of going into our week with victory already, not because of anything we've done, but because of what you've done, to go trusting in your salvation, that all things work for the good of those who believe and trusting that you are indeed our good heavenly Father. And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen.